Okay, um, welcome everyone to our October AI Expert Network meeting. As you know, we meet every other month and we're excited to have you joining us today. Um, at Xavier Health, we have a great AI community that's thriving. Not only do we have this AI Expert Network that is specifically designed for you, AI experts, um, so that you can talk shop right away and not have to re-explain, you know, what are the, the basics. You guys can just jump in and start talking shop with each other. Um, but we have an AI summit where we bring everyone together every year, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But that's happening in just a few weeks. And I hope all of you will join us. Um, we have AI working teams that work to develop great content that is even cited by um, FDA, the World Health Organization. Um, it's just really got great global credibility if you want to join those teams. Um, but we've also started a Slack community so you can stay in touch constantly, not just bi-monthly or annually. So we'll talk about all of, all of that a little bit later. But at this point, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Kirthi, who's going to uh, moderate our session today with our speaker. And today's topic is on incorporating AI techniques for medical imaging. And at that point, we can move on to the next slide. And Kirthi, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marla. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, my name is, uh, just as a quick introduction, my name is Keith C. Devlecker. I, I'm the, I work at MathWorks. I'm a global medical devices industry manager at MathWorks. Uh, I've been with MathWorks for 10 years now, and uh, my focus, or I'm in a, by training, I'm a signal and image processing engineer. Um, so, Xavier AI Experts Group, can you please next, advance to the next slide, Lars? So, I just want to quickly introduce the co-leads. Um, so I, we also have Simon uh, Perkowski, who is uh, the Digital Health Technologies Quality Lead at Genentech. Um, he also he co-owns or co-leads this session um, along with Arvind Rao, who is an associate professor at University of Michigan. So, so we all, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for joining this session. And now with that, I will. Can you please go to the next slide, Lars? Okay, so. Um, as Marla mentioned, I'll just quickly reiterate the mission, AI, Xavier AI Experts Network mission. Our goal is here is to establish a collaborative forum of AI experts across industry, academia, and government uh, with the main aim of accelerating development of AI solutions for the larger benefit or benefit of the global healthcare community. So this is more like a discussion and uh, please feel free to, you know, anytime jump in, share your ideas or ask questions. And one thing out of scope is definitely we're not really looking at, you know, kind of coming up with my papers or recommendation or guidances here. So this is just more like a community that's kind of designed to get like-minded people together, especially in AI and, uh, and that's about it. Okay. So with that, I will, would like to quickly introduce the speaker for today. Um, so we have Lars, Lars Bilak. Uh, he, uh, just a quick note about him. He was born in Germany um, after uh, uh, so studying physics with, uh, at the Kiepen Hoyer Institute. I hope I got that right. He did his, where he did his, did his bachelor's and master's in uh, astronomical imaging. Uh, he did, and he mainly focused on optimization of the telescope imaging process by investigating physical mechanisms of the system. After his master's, he started his PhD at the University of Medical Center in Freiburg, exchanging, basically swapping the telescopic imaging work with MRI. And the focus of today's presentation is to kind of showcase some of the work that he's done. Um, his focus, Lars has focused mainly on the topic of tumor segmentation, focusing on head and neck cancer, and thereby he learned how to work with CNNs and program CNNs, design CNNs, and um, his main work mainly focuses on combining CNNs for doing some image and analysis work like segmentation and the magnetic resonance imaging by optimizing the magnetic resonance protocols. So he has also developed MRI sequences for more efficient image, imaging with respect to automatic tumor segmentation. So that's just a quick background. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Lars. Lars, please take it from here and thank you. All right, thank you, Kirthi. Um, okay, thanks for having me here today. So uh, as already said, I'm Lars and uh, yeah, I'm going to present some work on the 3D tumor segmentation of head and neck cancer in multiparametric MRI, but I will not focus on the 
um, AI part uh, as such, but I'd rather focus on uh, how to use AI to optimize the data. Um, all right, let's start here. Uh, have a look at this cartoon. Um, I think this cartoon nicely symbolizes a barrier uh, between the two different perspectives. That is um, AI researchers and clinical researchers or AI experts and clinical, clinical researchers. Um, I started uh, working on tumor segmentation a couple of years ago and I noticed that there are two very different perspectives on how to solve a research problem between these two uh, groups of people. On the one hand, the clinical researcher is very good at modeling, experimenting, and they have an excellent idea of what their data is almost on a, on a pixel basis, what each number means. Well, that's ex ex exaggerated, I know. But on the other hand, the AI expert has the strong background in processing of uh, large data volumes, but they do not necessarily have the, all the information about the history and the origin of the data, which uh, I think can be a problem. And I'm trying to get these two positions a little bit closer together. So let me start you off with uh, two quotes. Um, the first one is from Hinton and he predicted or he said that uh, radiologists will become obsolete altogether if we are going on with the AI as we're doing at the moment. Okay, that's, that's quite something. On the other hand, um, we have the question, what's gonna happen if a machine makes clinical decisions, patient, treatment decisions for a patient, and that decision uh, turns out to be bad, fatal for the patient, who's, gonna, who's going to be blamed? Um, two very good questions or very good ideas. And let me say that much. I'm not on the same page as Hinton is, um, but I do think that our imaging procedures can and should be tailored more to what our AI systems can do. Um, and that means that the MRI isn't shouldn't just take pretty images that the radiologist likes to look at anymore, but it should acquire information, information as much as possible in a given set of time. Um, the timing issue will come up later. Um, okay, but before I start with that, I'd like to explain a little bit of my background so you won't get confused that, um, about the AI part uh, in the end. So here in Freiburg, we do a lot of MRI research. This is the medical physics department. And uh, we do, for example, call development. That's hardware, inter uh, interventional devices. We do software sequence programming, that is programming the scanner itself. We do the post-processing work. We do different kinds of imaging techniques, novel ones, fMRI, functional MRI. Um, we do MRI safety. We also involved in clinical studies. So basically we're doing all around uh, MRI, everything you can think of, except for developing the large magnet. Um, in the experimental radiology, that's the group I work at, um, I started using AI for segmentation of tumors. Um, that's basically the topic of my PhD thesis. And I was asking the question in my thesis, um, or I was trying to use AI, not to improve AI, but to improve the MRI techniques on a basic level. So maybe a little bit of a different approach than you'd usually see. Um, to understand what I'm doing, I'll have to explain a little bit of the background of MRI. At least I feel like I have to do that because I guess uh, that's what the physicist is, is expected to do. Um, so I began with the hypothesis of how important it is to understand which uh, data we are processing. And that's why I'm doing this. Um, I hope I can keep this short. Um, so everyone who already knows MRI and so on, go take a nap or something. 40 minutes should be enough. Ah, just kidding. Um, so MRI, we got in clinical practice, 
MRI is almost exclusively focused on water imaging. Uh, more precisely, it's focused on uh, the hydrogen atom. Oh, I don't know. Do you see my do you, do you see my mouse? Anybody? Or should I? Yeah. Yeah, we can we can see that. Yes. All right. Okay. So. Um, so it's, it's, it's based on the hydrogen atom. And conveniently, we have about 65% water in the human body, um, which is kind of the reason why we can use it at all. Because um, when you look at an MRI signal, only about three in one million uh, hydrogen atoms will contribute to the signal. So you need a large amount of signal Altogether. So, where does the signal come from? Um, in a proton, um, we have a property that's called nuclear spin. Um, and the nuclear spin is often compared to the rotation of charges around themselves. So, you have the um, atom, the nucleus here, and that's charged positively. And it's compared to a rotation of, of these charges around themselves and you can uh, think of it like um, these uh, toy spinning things that just won't tip over. It's basically the same idea. But let me say that much, um, this simile is convenient, but it's inherently false because nuclear spin is not linked to a rotation. Nevertheless, for basically everything in MRI, we can work with that and it works out just fine. All right. Um, from the spin that I've just introduced, we get a magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment is, uh, that's a mu. That's a product of the so-called gyromagnetic ratio and the spin quantum number. And that magnetic moment is um, what we will measure in the end. So we have a gyromagnetic ratio of 42 megahertz per Tesla. And um, if you now introduce a external magnetic field, we call it B0 or B0. Um, and that's, that field is the reason why you can't carry any scissors or anything into the scanner room, um, because that's about three Tesla and many clinical machines. Um, so the magnetic moment will just, if you have, if you have a, a main magnetic field B0, the, the magnetic moment will process around that with the 42 megahertz per Tesla. So in summary, you have a magnetic moment of each hydrogen atom, and that's turning really, really fast around the strong magnetic field. Um, so what are we doing with this now? A key feature of MRI is the ability to generate different contrasts. That is something that is very hard to do or very unique to MRI, I'd say. So I was talking about this precession of the magnetic moment and the previous slide. And this will only, you will only notice that if the magnetic moment is not parallel to the B0 field. Um, and furthermore, then if you, if you're not parallel to the B0 field, you'll see two different relaxation processes. The first one will cause that magnetic moment to return to an equilibrium state that is uh, parallel to B0. So if you're not parallel to B0, that thing's going to precess and come back to B0. Um, this time constant, until it goes there, uh, it's an exponential process. And that time constant is called T1. It's the longitudinal relaxation. and Importantly, that thing is tissue dependent. Also changes with the main magnetic field. A second uh, relaxation process is the T2. So that's, that's another time constant. And that's called the transverse relaxation. And basically, if in the beginning, all your spins or all your magnetic moments point in the same direction, after a while, they won't anymore because they uh, because they just drift out of each other. And if you add them in and up, you will get a net magnetic moment of zero. And that's a decay of your signal. Uh, so in the end, you have two time constants, T2 and T1. And 
depending on how you set up your machine, you can get very different contrasts of the same uh, of the same object. Take, for example, this legion here in the in the brain for two different contrasts. Here you got a T2 weighted one, and here you get a T1 weighted one. You find very different information on the same uh, on the same image slice tomographic slice. Um, all right, let's put this together. Um, I told you that MRI can create different contrasts. Um, these contrasts are, by the way, not only limited to T1 and T2, but you can also measure, for example, molecular self-diffusion. So that's Brownian motion. You can um, mo uh, image perfusion parameters. Uh, you can image susceptibility and so on. There's lots and lots of things that you can image, but they are also very dependent on, for example, how exactly do you set up your sequences and your sequence parameters. So that's how you program your machine. They are dependent on the, inherently physically dependent on the field strength that your machine has. Um, they are also dependent on the patient setup. So if you place your uh, receive coils onto your patient in a different way, then you may get a different image. Um, so altogether, this can lead to vastly differing uh, images, especially if you look at images from different sites. So if you pull images from two, three, four, five, however many hospitals you want, they will be a little bit different. Um, all right, so let me ask this question. Big data, as a researcher, method developer in MRI, do I really get big data? Um, I, for my part, uh, can answer, yeah, I don't really. That's unfortunately. And I know that there are some pretty large MRI databases out there, but these databases uh, I can't use to answer the questions I'm asking. Um, so, um, maybe a small collection of data with lots of content is equally valuable. Maybe, let's see. So for that, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the data I'm working with. That is uh, head and neck tumors from the FMISO study. Um, let me start with what head and neck tumors are all about. Um, so you've got a tumor in the head and neck region. Um, usually they're head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And just to give you an idea that there's, this is a really important kind of medical problem, they are within the top 10 of the most frequent cancer death. Um, let me just stress one point here especially. So, um, Many, many of these um, patients with head and neck cancer are uh, tobacco or alcohol abusers. So this will come in a little bit later again when uh, I tell you of some problems that you will inherently get when you try to do imaging here. Um, all right, so what are your treatment options? Um, you can just cut out so you can have uh, surgery or, and this is the database that I'm focusing on, um, you can have radiation therapy, usually in combination with chemotherapy, um, but I'll be focusing on the radiation therapy part. All right, so how is our protocol set up? So the FMISO study, FMISO is a um, Positron emission tomography tracer, which is called, which is uh, what all the study is set about. Um, PET is just another imaging device, um, which I won't be focusing on here. But we have a setup of the study um, where we have a seven week long treatment. In these seven weeks, you get 70 uh, gray dose administered to your uh, tumor. And within these uh, seven uh, weeks, or let's say before 
treatment starts, you get an FMISOPET, an MRI, and another FTG PET. That's just another tracer. Um, with the PET always comes also a CT. And during uh, the treatment, you will get uh, at weeks two and five another FMISO and MRI. Uh, I will be focusing on the MRI here. Um, right. So just one step back here, um, the radiation therapy planning is uh, something that, well, yeah. For the automatic tumor segmentation um, that we'll be doing later, we all know we need some kind of ground truth. And that's why it's important to understand how the radiation therapy planning is done. Um, so first, the tumor is defined manually in the radiation therapy planning software. Um, this is done based on all the available imaging contrasts. So you have CT, you have um, PET, and you have MRI, and you have all this information in one system simultaneously. In practice, the tumor is contoured on the MRI because it just has the best soft tissue contrast. And uh, the contouring is then copied to the other uh, modalities. Um, and the tumor is then uh, segmented on a slice by slice basis. Um, and with these contours, a uh, dose plan is calculated and the dose plan is then administered to the patients. Um, that, that is important to realize because the, the ground truth that's um, contoured in these images is what's actually uh, used to treat the patient. So um, I'd like to say that this is almost the best kind of ground truth that you can get for uh, medical image segmentation because that's really carefully derived since this is also applied to the patient. All right, um, so we have three different labels later. That is, uh, I, I call them GTVT, that's ground, uh, that's gross tumor volume tumor. Then we have the GTVLN, that's for lymph node, um, contouring the lymph node metastasis in the patients. And uh, we also have the background label. All right, now let's have a look at our input data. MRI only. Um, so, just to get an idea of what is there and how much is there. Uh, during the um, study protocol of the FMISO study, we get a, a pre-contrast T2-weighted image. That's 45, 45 slices. We get a T1-weighted image, another 45. We get diffusion-weighted ones. That's uh, 25. And from these, we calculate an ADC map. That's uh, the diffusion map, physical parameter. We have multi-echo to two-weighted ones to uh, calculate the T2 star map. Um, we use dynamic contra contrast enhanced imaging to calculate the uh, perfusion, uh, perfusion parameters such as the volume transfer constant, uh, that's K-trans or the extracellular extravascular space, that's VE. And we also have a post-contrast T1-weighted one um, where we use, uh, which separates uh, fat and water content. And here we only use the, um, the water content one. So in the end, we acquire per patient per exam about 2000 images, which is quite a lot, I'd say. Um, okay, but how does it look? Mm, the patients we're dealing with, um, need to be scanned in the same position as they will be when the radiation therapy is administered. Um, and thus, they are fixated to the table in one of these um, thermoplastic radiation masks. That's the same one they will have on their face during the, um, during the treatment. And due to, these, uh, due to this mask, um, use of uh, specially fitted head coil that you usually get when you want to have head and neck images in MRI 
just can't be done because that's already fixed to the table and you just can't bring them together. Um, and because you can't use this specially fitted head coil, um, you need to wrap around the receiver coils that you need for a signal re reception around the head and also on the chest, making this a uh, very uncomfortable uh, position to lie in. I can tell you, I tried it myself. Um, also this protocol duration, depending on how smooth everything runs is 35 to 60 minutes. Um, now, if you think of the background of these patients, this can be quite hard on them. And um, image quality will degrade whenever patients move, patients get uncomfortable, whatever, or even they may just say, okay, I'm not, I can't do it. And we get that a lot and they interrupt the measurements. And once they do that, they usually never come back. So you lost people to your study. All right, so the clinical goal here is clear. Um, we only have a limited amount of time per patient. And that's not only restricted due to monetary reasons, but also by com patient compliance. Uh, so the faster we acquire the information needed, the better quality images we will get, and the more likely it is that we actually get the images. All right, um, now I talked a lot about the whereabouts of the data. So now I come to what you are the experts in, and that is the tumor segmentation. So how did we do that? Um, generally, we started out with the deep medic network architecture that's published by Kamnitsis. And um, at the time I started working with that, this network architecture was scoring very high on, on different uh, challenges and was very, very well suited for, for that kind of segmentation. It's a linear feed forward model. Um, special about it is it has two different res resolution pathways. So you have a high resolution one that takes the original resolution of your images and it has a low resolution one with downsampled patches, but you get larger patch sizes and therefore you can incorporate larger contextual information. Um, right. Um, in total, we use seven different 3D input channels and train for three output uh, channels. That's, uh, as I said before, the tumor, the lymph nodes and the background. Um, how did we implement it? Um, although Dematic was publicly available and still is, and uh, it was implemented in Python, we decided to adapt it to our own processing framework. Um, I'm doing most of my work here in MATLAB and uh, I just found it more convenient and also needed quite some changes to the network itself. Uh, so, um, we had some help from uh, MathWorks themselves. Thanks Arnie, by the way, he's here, I think. He did a lot of the work here and um, we integrated the basic layout into MATLAB and designed it so it would fit our needs. Um, right, it's designed such that it takes a, a one single configuration file now and then it just, uh, is set up the way you, you need it. Uh, the configuration file, I kept it the same as in the original model to ensure some compatibility. Um, we trained all the networks on a cloud computing service, Amazon, um, because as you'll see later, we have quite a huge number of computations to do. And there was just no way we could do that here in house. Um, let me talk a little bit about the pre-processing because that's where I spent quite some time on uh, for my work. So um, basically we are having some different MRI input channels um, and the ground truth is contoured on one of them. And the thing is, they, it's not necessarily contoured on the same one. Um, we just don't know. All these, um, all these seven input channels have different or can have different uh, voxel resolutions and they range from two by two by three to a very high resolution of uh, half a millimeter by two millimeters. Um, so 
first of all, what you see here is that uh, you somewhat get these, we call them spaghetti voxels. They're not isotropic. So our in-plane resolution is much higher than the throughput through plane resolution. Um, but also um, these sequences, they, they may, may be tilted to each other. So they, they don't just lie all on top of each other, but they may actually be tilted with respect to each other. Um, okay, so basically interpolating all of them to a common frame of re reference, that's fairly easy to do. I mean, we already have the um, registration matrices for free from the, uh, from the contouring process, so that's no problem. However, the hard part comes in when you try to um, get the ground truth to wherever you want it. And that's a problem that I was facing in the beginning. And for a long time, I didn't realize that I was having this problem because I wasn't looking properly at my data. Um, so in reality, the, many of these contours are, um, are drawn on a less resolved uh, image than the one than the highest resolved one. And that's where we want to go because we don't want to lose any information. So we always always only interpolate to higher resolutions, not to lower ones. Um, so if you have these 2D stacked polygons, which is really what the contours are, and you want to um, you want to move it into a different frame of reference, which may be tilted with respect to your original frame of reference. If you're just using simple interpolation techniques, what you get is, what you have is something like that. And what you get is something like that. So you get bare staircasing artifacts. And um, so we were working uh, for a long time on an algorithm which just takes care of that and nicely interpolates that by a uh, linear interpolation based on distance matrices, really. Um, okay, so just say, saying that you really need to take care of your data here. Um, just about the normalization for the contrast weighted images, that's uh, all pretty straightforward. We're just using a modified z-score normalization. Um, however, for we also have quantitative data. That is, for example, the diffusion, that is the perfusion data, and that's the T2 star data, which is uh, another time constant. And uh, for that, as a physicist, I wasn't very happy when people just said, yeah, just normalize it, because you just lose the physical information, which is comparable in between patients. So what we did is we used a histogram approach to preserve that physical meaning across patients by just accumulating all data in one histogram and then uh, normalizing it based on the 10 and 90 percent per, uh, per 10 and 90 percentiles of that histogram. So all data was normalized based on the same normalization parameter. Um, okay. So then came the big question mark of parameter optimization. So maybe, maybe that's a question for everybody. Um, how, how do you optimize a large network with this huge space of hyperparameters? So, I mean, we not only have all these normal hyperparameters like learning rate and so on, but we also have no clue of how many um, convolutional layers do we need? How how many channels do we need in each convolutional layer? Um, maybe even the question, should we use more than two, uh, more than two pathways and so on? <laughs> okay. Um, I had two attempts at that. The one being Bayesian optimization. I heard that, uh, that cue earlier in, in the discussion. So basically for Bayesian optimization, what I did is I set up my network as a function of the hyperparameters. And then I used a target parameter that would be the validation loss in network training after a set amount of epochs. Don't set the epochs too high because then it's just gonna take forever. 
and then you optimize for that validation loss uh, or let a Bayesian optimization algorithm do that for you, which is what I did. Um, well, you can only optimize for so many parameters because I mean, this parameter space includes probably millions of configurations. And um, I only used it for the network depth and network width and learning rates. And then there's always the educated guessing. So in the end, at some point, you just have to sit down and say, yeah, that's what I'm going to train on now. Um, and the world, that's, that's how the world is. Um, so what did we end up with? Um, we had a network using 10 convolutional layers in the two pathways with 104 um, feature maps each. And we have another three convolutional layers after concatenation with 150 feature maps each. Um, each layer was made of a batch normalization, uh, leaky ReLU activations, dropouts of 20%. And for the optimization of the network, we used a dice loss uh, layer. Um, the input size was chosen I'm missing my mouse, was chosen with 78 by 78 by 8 pixels or 38 by 38 by 8 for the uh, low resolution pathway, which amounts to uh, half a millimeter by two millimeters. Um, and then we just stuffed in as many, uh, as many patches as possible into a, a mini batch to uh, speed up training. Okay, so where does that leave us? Um, at the scientific question, I guess. So given the option of two, three, four, five, however many possible contrasts you have, in my case, it's seven. Given that we want to reach the best possible outcome, that is the treatment or uh, the best treatment is when you get the best segmentation and given a set amount of scan time per patient, the question is, which sequence or contrast does contribute the most or has the most information content? Um, so that was the question I was really trying to answer. And this is how I did it. So basically uh, it's a leave one out analysis. So I have a amount of data which I split into training and testing set. Well, that's what everybody does. And then I train my network based on all available channels. So we have all these seven channels plus the, uh, plus the ground truth. Um, next, I leave one of the channels out and then I compare the segmentation results of these two different networks. Uh, and next I repeat steps three and four just with different channels left out. Um, Let's have a look at the numbers of, uh, of cases I'm dealing with. So at that time we were had 33 patients registered in total in our uh, clinical trial, which amounts to 99 data sets because they come three times during the treatment. Um, but from these 99 data sets, um, we could only use 36 because uh, as you see, some of them were missing information. I can't really train on missing information that would skew the whole thing even more. And um, some of them have horrible image quality, as I told you before, that can happen when the patients um, do get, uh, do some movement or whatever. Um, so in the end, we were having an, an extremely small data set for deep learning. Um, with this small data set, um, it's just natural that I need to decrease my test set to, uh, to the minimum size of one. And then I just repeat the whole process again. So I have another leave one out uh, method going on here. In the end, this leaves me with almost 500 completely trained networks or networks that I need to completely train. And that's why I need huge processing power and time until the whole thing is done. 
Um, let's look at some of the results. Uh, so here on the left side, you see um, a network that's trained on all the available data. And you see in, um, in blue, the, the segmentation result for um, tumor in this cyan uh, color, the segmentation result for the lymph node metastasis. And I uh, just drew in the red line, the ground truth. And uh, if you see, if you just leave out the T2 star channel, then your segmentation performance already drops a lot and you get a lot of over segmentation. Um, looking at all trained networks in, with the reference network, so the one which had all channels uh, included, uh, gives you this plot. So you have the tumor segmentation and you have the lymph node segmentation and you see the dice score on the y-axis. And you see that we get a high segmentation of 65%, um, but we also get a lot of low uh, scoring, um, low scoring segmentations. Why is that? Um, well, yeah, we have few data, but also I looked at the correlation of the volume with the dice score, which, uh, which struck me when I was looking into the data because especially for the lymph node metastasis, you get many, many tiny uh, lymph node metastasis. And we're having seven different input channels which were acquired in a time span of about an hour. So in this time, if you swallow, borders can move a little bit, which um, makes the borders of the tumor quite fuzzy for the networks to train on. So if you have a larger bulk volume, you'll also get a better segmentation. That's, that's okay. Um, but now let's look at the main results here. If you compare all the trained networks to the reference network, which is trained on all available channels, um, and then you see, um, depending on which channel you leave out, how much worse you get in segmentation. Or in other words, this plot first of all shows that you get worse whichever channel you leave out, but by different amounts. Um, first of all, you see that different channels contribute differently to the two uh, targets that we're looking into. So. For example, the T1 weighted contrast has much more influence on the lymph node segmentation than for example, uh, the T1 weighted contrast enhanced one and vice versa. Um, also, um, I marked these, uh, some of them with an asterisk, asterisk um, and these marked ones are the ones which were statistically significant by just, uh, t-testing the, the thing. And as you can see, the T2 star contrast has the highest influence uh, on both uh, tumor and lymph node. So let, let, let me summarize that. So based on the small database I showed you, um, we could identify which channels contribute how much to the segmentation of the tumor, and we could con uh, we could identify the one that contributes most, which is one of the parameter maps that usually isn't looked at very much, uh, and that's both for GTVT and GTV lymph node. Um, so we're working here with the data set, which uh, I believe has an excellent data quality and an excellent ground truth, but on the other hand. Well, the question about generaliz generalization is still open because I mean, we're using very few data. And um, also you can ask questions like, what, what about the ground truth? Can, can we really not get better? For example, um, there are some uh, ideas of using histology. Uh, that's especially important in, for example, prostate, uh, prostate cancer. Uh, where you can get histology. And we're actually also doing that, but there are other problems. They are good, but 
then the registration becomes even more difficult. Um, what else do we have? So did we get these somehow closer? Um, the AI expert and the clinical researcher? I believe, yes, we should use big data methods also on small data collections. We can do that and we should do that just because we need to tailor our method that we're using now that are that are optimized for the human eye and for human decision making in the future also for AI methods because we need to get this data in and we need to know which data we need to acquire. So um, there's always this picture between, between uh, for researcher, basic researchers and clinical practice, this uh, so-called valley of death, which needs to be bridged. And I believe there is a similar valley between AI users, AI uh, scientists and clinical scientists, which also needs to be bridged. Um, I hope I could convince you uh, of these ideas. And with that, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank my, my group. Um, I'd especially like to thank MathWorks for their assistance and uh, the Department of Radiation Oncology, which we work very closely with to get all the great data. All right, that's it. I hope I didn't go over time too much. All right, so Kirthi, um, would you like to take it from here and manage the discussion and any questions? Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Lars, for sharing um, all the details. I think it was pretty insightful and uh, it was great to see how you used AI to actually solve some of your problems with MRI imaging and segmentation. So um, I think we can now open up the floor for some questions, if people have any. Oh, yeah, and feel, feel free to unmute your line and ask directly. Yeah, feel free to unmute. Hi, Kirti, this is Arvind. Um, wonderful talk, Lars. I really enjoyed it. A uh, quick question for you. Um, and I'm, I'm asking this question, you know, as a, uh, in your capacity as a practitioner, mm -hmm. which is, let's say that you encounter three tools, uh, all for radiation treatment planning, one from GE, one from Siemens, one from Radian, one from Apple. Um, and everybody's got capabilities to be able to build good tools these days. Deep learning and, and model building is now very accessible to a lot of people. How would you go about, how should a consumer of such a planning tool go about evaluating in a rigorous sense which tool is the best for their requirement? Um, and, and my question is layered with the assumption that while I know Apple is very good at building deep learning for general imaging, it may not necessarily understand the nuances of medical imaging. But among the other three vendors, Varian, GE, and Siemens, they have some notion of understanding that is better than the, the usual level of um, MRI knowledge. But even then, there is variability. So when you spend, when you're looking to spend a ton of money on acquiring a system, how should one go about calibrating and verifying and validating the system before they decide to purchase it? Well, I think in the end, what determines which system is best is decided by how well the treatment outcome is of your patients. I mean, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what you're always going for. You want to have the best treatment outcome. Um, we're not anywhere near, and I hope we will never be anywhere close to a situation where a, um, an AI system will make a final decision and nobody gonna, is going to overwatch that. So in the end, um, whichever tool you choose as a practitioner, you have to uh, sign the decision of the system in the end. So you can use it and 
if you use it and it, it doesn't do what you're expecting it to do or you see obvious flaws, um, then you will just stop using it and nothing bad happened for the patients. Um, if it's giving you good suggestions and you incorporate many of these suggestions, um, you as a practitioner, I guess you can, you can then go into the competition and compare yourselves, uh, yourself to other practitioners who use other systems. And that's something that then clinical trials probably have to decide which systems are really the best ones. And this is probably also the way how the vendors will evaluate their systems. Maybe uh, just by having practitioners use their systems and giving the feedback and saying, okay, I needed to change that much. I needed to, uh, this doesn't work or uh, that's great. That really helped me. Mm. Yeah, and in the end for practitioners, what's really important is not only how good the decision is, but how fast uh, or how much it speeds up their workflow. But um, now I'm, I'm a physicist and the researcher, so um, I'll never be using these systems in a way that I would have to choose over one or the other, because I'm always gonna, if I, if I use it, I want to change it. That's just me as a researcher. Thank you. Thanks, Lars. Um, I see there's also another question here from one of the newest members of the group, Kavita, Kavita Kulkarni. Uh, her question is, she's wondering if you have any point of view on federated learning, feeding data from diverse data sources into your AI models. And specifically her question is about uh, the challenges that are around pre-processing. Um, that's a great question. And this is something that we actually want to incorporate in the future also. Um, now I'm not exactly sure uh, what you mean by diverse data sources. Um, is it either um, an MRI and a CT and a PET, uh, so different imaging data sources, or is it e uh, even altogether completely different sources, like um, maybe biological data, um, virus status on the patient that you could also incorporate? Because that would be that would be extremely interesting to have all these clinical tests that you uh, that you take anyway incorporated in your decision system. Um, maybe then it wouldn't be the just the um, segmentation, but more in the direction of classification of the tumor. Uh, but then you would need. A completely different uh, CNN because you have different kinds of inputs. The one is an image, the other one is just a, maybe a binary information. I'm, we haven't incorporated anything like that, but I think this will come in the near future. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the pre-processing is not the main issue then. Um, but the network architecture, how do you do it? Uh, how do you feed it to the network so, so it really works well? Um, then you just do the pre-processing uh, like you always did. That's what I think, but I haven't implemented it yet, so. Yeah. Thank you, Lars, for answering that. Um, I, uh, so, so one angle was integrating all kinds of omics data along with image, but my question was more to do with how do you deal with um, data coming from a GE system versus a Siemens system taken from completely different uh, input sources? Um, you know, one I in see. the US and another in Europe, maybe. Okay. Um, and so, so the standards are very different. So that that was what I was getting at in the beginning that you uh, will get different contrasts if you go to different sites. Um, one thing that's really nice about MRI is that we understand it. We know how the signal is generated and we know how it's, how different sources contribute to the signal. So in principle, we can model the signal acquisition and um, we know the different components of the signal. 
So um, if we all have that, and if either we just go ahead and say, okay, we, we only use um, quanti yeah, quantitative data, then we can just do that. And then all the, uh, all the data should be the same um, because if, if, if the machines work properly, we can, uh, we can deal in absolute numbers. Um, or we have contrast weighted images, but then we also have an understanding of how the contrast weighting comes together. And we can, uh, if we've seen enough of the data, we can normalize it to each other, um, which would be a way of, uh, of pre-processing, absolutely. Um, this is something that we, that we should definitely think about. Um, but I guess in the end we should uh, we should we would need to use some kind of atlas of tissue parameters that we expect in certain regions to um, to then and disentangle the underlying parameters. Yeah, and this but is it's Marla. Possible. Uh, thank you. This is Marla. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'd like to just mention a couple of things, and then we can stay on for whoever else wants to stay on and continue talking. Uh, but for those of you where we promised a, a stop at the top of the hour, um, let me just say a couple things. One is the, the question related to which equipment do you use? How do you know how to vet out which vendor you should go with? We actually have uh, Timothy Sue is online with us right now. He's one of the co-leaders of the AI at the point of care working team that we have at Xavier. And I'll put a link in here if you're interested in the working teams. They're looking at exactly that, where providers are approached by vendors saying, hey, we've got the greatest tool ever. And you're like, well, how do I know? Like, what, what do I actually look at? So they're working on developing a playbook for the providers to know what questions to ask. And then we certainly have the uh, good machine learning practices team that's helping you understand uh, what does good look like so that you would know to compare vendor to vendor to vendor. So that's just one example. But um, uh, also want to point out that we have our, our summit coming up very soon, uh, meaning in the next few weeks, November 4th and 5th is our workshop. Uh, so Lars, if you could maybe go on to the next slide real quick. Um, it's going to talk about the next uh, networking meeting in December, where we are being joined by uh, Alexi Grossman from FDA to talk about issues and reference standard determination for performance evaluation studies of uh, AI machine learning based medical devices. And we have meetings coming up in uh, you know every other month. So uh, uh, please keep an eye out for those. But this kind of discussion that you guys are having, uh, Michelle on our team just dropped in the Slack community, I think, I don't know, um, the Slack community link right there, uh, where you guys can keep talking constantly. You don't have to stop at the top of the hour. Um, so you can drop things in, ask each other questions, say, here's a reference for that, or hey, great question, let's jump on a call. You guys can stay connected all the time. Um, and so it's not just with the AI experts, but it's with our working team members, and you can invite whoever you want into that community to join that discussion. Um, so hopefully you'll take advantage of that and continue these great questions. On the next slide is uh, just a reference again to some of the links that Michelle's been putting into the chat box. Um, our AI Summit, we have phenomenal discussions happening. So Bakul Patel from FDA and Matthew Diamond will be joining us. A workshop focused on how do we fit AI into our current quality management systems. Uh, lots of great topics for this entire event. You're obviously interested in AI, so I hope you'll join us. Um, and then the working teams uh, do phenomenal work. This, the, the outcome of their work is cited by FDA. It's uh, being discussed at the World Health Organization. It's being used by standards organizations. So it would be worth your time to, uh, to join those groups because the information is very credible, what they're creating. We have a blog that is being generated by our AI and operations team. So there's a link where you can join in on that discussion. And we've already talked about Slack. Um, so with that, I, I want to thank Lars for being such an amazing uh, uh, presenter. Your, your research is phenomenal. Um, and Kirthi, thank you so much for moderating it. And thank you to our co-leaders of the AI Expert Network for all the work that you do. Um, I'll just so one, ask, oh, go ahead. One, one request, Marla, I have to the community is, if you have any suggestions on future topics, please feel free to let us know. I mean, you can put it in the chat window or you can also use the Slack community channel. I mean, yeah. we are constantly looking for new ideas and we want to try and get topics or people who can actually address some of the questions you have in your mind. So please feel free to speak out. Yeah. And uh, yeah. 
Great point. We want to we want to have these discussions around what you want to talk about. So that's fantastic, yeah. Kirthi. Thank you. Um, so with that, it's the top of the hour, but we'll stay on. I'll stay here. So several of you had questions. There's more questions in the chat box. So feel free to unmute your line and continue yeah. the discussion. So um, and thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of your Friday for those of you who are dropping off. <laughs> thank so you. I think there's okay. one another question from Dan. I think Lars, if you. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, so Dan asked um, that I uh, mentioned the challenge of, challenges of generalizability of my I, I model. What do you think are the key factors that we should be focused on? Is it getting data from more diverse MRI manufacturers? Is it better techniques for transfer learning? Well, um, it, it really depends on what you want to do. If you want to do the research that I'm doing, I don't believe you can really get into the big data um, regime because what I really want to do is I want to acquire data and I want to then have a look whether I need to acquire data differently. Um, if I do that, I need to change something and that way I'm, or I'm starting at zero data again. Um, and that's so, so what you really should be looking at if you want to do stuff like that is how can your deep learning models perform well on small databases? Um, we have a project going on here in Freiburg that's trying to answer that question, how to deal with that. And I mean, in, in the end, we still want to use deep learning methods because once we, we, we figure it out which data is nice to use, we will be acquiring a lot of those. Um, and then, yes, of course, uh, we also need to look into how, and that's that's probably the same answer and the same question as from Kavita before, how do you, uh, how do you incorporate data from different sources? So their stuff can be done by physical modeling. And uh, I guess you can also use uh, AI methods to do some of the work there. Um, I, I hope that answers what- Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lars. That was uh, helpful, appreciate it. Okay, so then there's a question from uh, William um, from a biologist who's surprised to hear of proton spin in contrast and not water stipple moment. Um, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, uh, that, maybe, maybe you can take it offline, Lars. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't a question; it was a comment. I just for for your edification for for presentations, it, it came out of the blue. I have no idea what you're talking about and hadn't heard of it before. I just wanted to let you know. Thanks. Okay. All right. So, so that's um, I, I see. I, I see the. Oh, all right. Thank you. <laughs> um. Actually, I do have a question. Uh, you sure. mentioned two. You mentioned two, you had to use two terms: uh, Brownian motion and diffusion in your lecture. And I wonder if you were referring to the same phenomena there. Yes. So I'm I'm talking about the molecular self diffusion of um, of molecules, um, which MRI is quite a unique machine to be able to measure that. Because if you're thinking about other techniques to measure uh, diffusion molecular self diffusion, um, what you usually, or what often happens is that you need to introduce some kind of other material then, and then look at how it diffuses. Just probably the simplest uh, idea is of putting some, uh, some paint in a, uh, in a bottle of water and look at how fast the paint spreads. But then it's not the water diffusion that you're looking at, but the diffusion of the paint molecules in your water sample. And for MRI, you're actually measuring the water itself. And there's, I, I can talk a lot about that because I uh, did some research on the uh, diffusion measurements. Uh, I think that's gonna go too far here. Awesome. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Lars. So it looks like we are at the end, I think we have I think we've covered all the questions, Lars, so thank you. All right. Thank you so much for joining. And, uh, and yeah, I think if you have uh, 
more questions, again, as Marla said, feel free to use the Slack channel and uh, yeah. we all can stay connected. Great. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Lars, for such a fantastic presentation. And thank you again, Kirthi, for moderating. And I um, hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Have yep. a good one. Thank we'll you, see you at thanks, the AI Lars. Summit. Thanks. See you at the AI Summit, right? Yay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Take Bye. care. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Lars.